things. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Thursday of the month, which means it's time for Vegan Doc Talk with Dr. Scott Harrington. And today he has a very important topic that a lot of people struggle with, food addiction. He's going to talk about from going from cravings to control and how to navigate food addiction. Please welcome Dr. Scott Harrington. I love your topic and I love your show. How are you, Dr. Harrington? I'm doing well. Hey, thank you, Chef AJ, for having me on again. I love it. And this is a great topic, uh, a, a topic that you have spoke about a lot and have had a lot of folks on uh, on your show. And um, and uh, I, so I'm happy to uh help to add to this and uh, maybe I can provide a slightly different perspective uh, for for your listeners. And um, so once again, thanks for having me on. All right, looks like we might be frozen a second. Uh, looks like we might be frozen. Looks like we might be frozen. I'm still here. Looks like we might be frozen. I'm going to have to wait till I know that we're good to go. I'm going to have to wait. Uh, let me check. Wow. All right. Hey, Dr. Harrington, I froze for a second, but I'm told that you stayed on. So I must, I've missed whatever you said for the last couple of seconds, but um, I'll watch the replay. But I just wanted to thank you for even talking about this topic because some people, even doctors, even medical doctors don't think it's real. Well, yeah, I'm, I, I'm glad to kind of like uh, do a little uh, chat back and forth before, because I'm, I'm glad about, we can talk about this topic because I really think it's pervasive and it's actually really good to think about the various things in our life that we are addicted to and how much hold they have over us. So uh, when, when you learn about food as a potential addictive properties, then you can think about all the other things that could potentially be having other bad effects on your life. Uh, even things that, um, that seem like you couldn't be addicted to like foods. Right. And maybe that's just, maybe there's a problem with the name, calling it food addiction. Maybe it should be processed food addiction, ultra processed food addiction, because I don't think people have to go to arugula anonymous meetings too often. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I, I, that's what I mentioned in the topic. Yeah. In the, in the discussion, uh, you know, ultra processed foods are drug-like foods. So yeah, that's what I guess we really need to uh, be calling a spade a spade. It should be uh, ultra processed food addiction. Right. Great. Well, I can't, I look forward to your presentation and then I'm sure we'll have some questions from the live audience and a few have been sent in in advance. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it up. And of course you got to give me the feedback to make sure that uh, we're firing on all cylinders here. All right. Am I good to go? Looking good. Okay. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Dr. Scott Harrington. I have an online practice, Vegan Primary Care, where you can see me in many U.S. states. Uh, I can prescribe uh, prescriptions. I can be your primary care doctor. I can send referrals and x-ray requests and things like that. I'm licensed. Uh, I, I'm board certified in lifestyle medicine as well as family medicine. And uh, here are the states uh, where I am licensed. And so... Uh, many states across the U.S., I can be your doctor, your primary care doctor. If you're in Florida, I have an office on Fridays in Pinellas Park where you can see me in person. These are the insurances that I use for uh, visits, Aetna, Cigna, TRICARE, and Medicare. And my patients uh, enjoy a free visit on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. We call it the Get to Your Goal Weight Loss Meeting. If uh, you want to attend, it's free and you, we get to uh, have icebreaker questions where we discuss uh, what's going on with our vegan weight loss journey every week. Okay, so my talk this week is food addictions from craving to control. So I'll start with the story. I'll start with the story. And this happened uh, just, just the other night, just the other night. I, I was in the, at night. And I was, you know, feeling a little hunger. Really, I was feeling a craving. 
And I walked into the kitchen, opened up the fridge, and I perused the fridge, and it looked too healthy. It, too, it looked too healthy. It wasn't going to really satisfy my sweet tooth. And then uh, about at eye level, there was a, a vegan, there were some vegan cookies. And before you know it, it was like the cookie jumped into my mouth and I was eating cookies. Before I knew it, I was eating cookies. And, and uh, it just kind of goes to show that sometimes we're not in control. And my rational brain told me that this was not a good idea. But before I even had that thought, the cookies were in my mouth. And so I had to do what I, uh, what I tell my patients, uh, uh-oh, you're on fire. You have to stop, drop, and roll when you're on fire. So I had to put the cookies down. I had to stop, get out of there, and I had to reflect. Oh, my gosh, I had just sort of gone non-compliant, and, uh, and my rational brain was not in charge. So that was a story, and that happened to Dr. Harrington just the other day, and uh, it, it made me think that this would be a great topic to discuss. That's so <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Chef. And that's funny how cookies literally have learned to fly. <laughs> the cookies, it just jumped right in my mouth. That's right. <laughs> um, well, everyone has experienced uh, kind of binge behavior where or disordered eating. You know, at some point in our life, we've had a whole box of uh, cookies or potato chips. And, you know, we've eaten a carton of ice cream or some, something like that. Something that we're uh, ashamed of. Uh, that uh, we shouldn't have done, but it doesn't mean that you're necessarily an addict if you've ever done this. Uh, everything is on a spectrum, just like uh, not all people who drink alcohol are alcoholics. So what is going on? What is going on with this behavior? Why do we act out of our rational mind? Why, why, are we, uh, why, don't we, why aren't we in control all the time? Well, there's forces at play. There's forces at play. The addiction and the addictive properties of substances hijack our normal survival pathway. So the reason why I'm highlighting this is that there are people who say to me, oh, I don't have an addictive personality. Uh, well, I, I you know, hate to tell you that everybody has addictive potential and we all have the machinery and the mechanisms in our brain that are, are hijacked by these uh, addictive substances. So we all have the potential and we should all be aware of this. And so the picture here shows someone uh, grabbing an apple. And if you imagine in you know, maybe millions of years of evolution, uh, these things developed in our, our brain. But what it was is we found a food, it was sweet and ripe and we ate it and it lit up chemicals in our brain that helped us remember like, look, a year from now, there's going to be this food and it's in this apple tree and it's located over that, over that hill over yonder. It had to lay down a memory in our brain so that next year we would come back and we would find the apple again and we wouldn't starve. So this is a, a, a helpful survival mechanism that these uh, substances will uh, hijack. So this substance that we're talking about is dopamine. Dopamine is the uh, chemical in regarding motivation, reward, and learning and memory. And there's a specific place in the brain that, uh, that lights up when, we're, when you have a flood of dopamine. It's the nucleus accumbens. It's the reward center in the brain. And so this is a chemical situation. Uh, the next analogy that I want to talk about is the neural pathway. Uh, and uh, Vera Tarman had talked about this, uh, that nerves that fire together, wire together. And, and what this is all about is imagine uh, behaviors as we learn things, you're making connections with the neurons, literal pathways. But when you think of the pathway as uh, the landscape, a pathway in the landscape. If you think about trying to create a new behavior, uh, it can be very difficult. I mean, even things like, you know, swinging a bat or riding a bike for the first time, uh, you don't have the connections there that are hardwired very well so that it feels difficult. It feels cumbersome and unwieldy such that imagine trying to walk through a woods that doesn't have a pathway through it. That, the, that is very difficult. Branches are falling in your face and you can't see the path. And it's, 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 there's some friction. It's kind of difficult. Whereas 
if you continue to do the behavior over and over again, or if the behavior is very, uh, very strong, uh, a strong signal, or you know something very fearful happens, or you you know experience something really delicious, uh, the the dopamine is going to help uh, form nerve triggers and nerve pathways in your brain. So you're gonna it's it's it, their pathways will be formed along the nerves. And there are things that can make these pathways stronger and deeper and more uh, like a, a road in your brain. Uh, so we talked about the salience, the strength, uh, strong emotions or strong reward from doing a behavior, how often you do it. Um, sometimes behaviors form together, the uh, nerves that fire together, wire together. And in this little picture, we show like a book and coffee, you know, or um, something like if you wake up and you always look at your phone, you know, waking up and looking at your phone is kind of a behavior that forms together. Or there could be cues like timing cues, like um, it's breakfast time, I'm gonna eat breakfast. And so these behaviors can go with times and locations. And so these, these connections all form in the brain. Well, if you are taking in a substance that's really strong, it's really strong, it's called strong strength or salience, it really creates a super highway instead of a pathway. And the reason why we're going over this is that once you start to get used to these behaviors, if you imagine the picture of the woods versus the picture of the road, it's easier to go and fall back into old habits or it's easier to walk along the road than it is to forge a new path through the woods. And that's why these behaviors keep coming back and back and we keep falling into these types of, of behaviors. And we're talking specifically about, I mean, we're talking about in general about addiction and behaviors and habits in general, and we'll relate it to food here in a minute. But just like we can adapt and our nerve, there's a plasticity in the brain, which means that you can change things, you can change your habits. And just as you, a road that is not walked on over time in nature will start to regress and other pathways will be formed. It's the same thing that happens in the brain, just like this analogy of the path. It starts to regress. Okay, what chemically is going on with this dopamine? Well, if you think about various stimuli, like uh, a very sweet and sugary, uh, a sweet and fatty uh, meal, that is going to raise your dopamine above the baseline. Uh, and in some studies, they suggest 100 percent more than baseline or 150 percent. Well, uh, sex actually was more about 200 predicted. Uh, so a doubling of the baseline versus cocaine, which is even more 250 percent of the baseline. So higher dopamine. But these things pale in comparison to uh, these very strong drugs such as methamphetamine or PCP, where methamphetamine is like a thousand percent on the baseline. So what happens? Well, you hear about drugs. Uh, I know I'm talking about food, but we're talking about the drug-like effects of food. And they start. you start to have a tolerance to it where you need more and more of a sugary sweet, uh, more amounts, uh, and you can have symptoms of withdrawal. That's because it's a literal physical chemical dependency. What's happening is that as the dopamine is coming out into the synapse of the nerve, um, if you have high, high dopamine, high chemical exposed, it's too much for the brain. So the brain adapts by down-regulating dopamine receptors. Um, so this picture here on the other side of the synapse there showing these receptors where the yellow, uh, the yellow is uh, representing dopamine here and the purple receptors, they literally get down-regulated. They down -regulated. There's less receptors. And this is, this is a picture here where, uh, the dopamine, as you get more and more, the body will create chemicals that communicate to stop producing as much dopamine. So you get less receptors and less dopamine. Uh, fortunately, this process can be reversed uh, with uh, abstinence from the dopamine producing substance. You can reverse this. And so that is the good news. So here are actual pictures of brains in functional MRIs. and and on one side, we have the control or the people who are not under influences of any drugs or substances, uh, and they induce the, the, uh, the brains, and you will see the uh, areas of redness. That means that a lot of dopamine is being released. 
on the right brains, these are brains that have addiction to various substances and they're actually producing less dopamine. And so in this color here, it's green, suggesting that less is being produced. You've heard lots of uh, vegan physician influencers discuss about how your tongue actually, or your taste for food, you actually become less sensitive to the natural uh, and subtle tastes of fruit and vegetables, uh, whole food. When you're used to eating very processed and salty foods, uh, it, it almost makes the uh, natural food seem bland. Uh, and so, as Chef AJ was mentioning, is food addiction real? We have to eat to survive. Well, maybe we should be calling it ultra-processed food addiction. But think about it. Is, is the fact that food can be addictive and the fact that it's cheap and that it's legal, you don't get arrested for eating food, uh, and it's easy to obtain, and it's everywhere. We live in an obesogenic environment that it's all around us. We're getting constantly exposed. So it's meeting all these kind of... Uh, uh, the context, the context, the salience, the frequency, and the cues, these are all hammering us from all directions. And so actually, food addiction may be more prevalent than we think. Uh, even in the whole food plant-based uh, spectrum, there are foods that can be triggering to some people like dried fruit or nuts or avocado. I'm not saying that these foods are evil or that they should be avoided. But if you have food addiction tendencies and it tends to, if you can't stop eating dried fruit or nuts, if you're having addictive behaviors around them, then uh, you should consider them as a trigger. Thank you for saying that, by the way. Absolutely. Because people don't realize they have to know themselves. And just because a food is healthy doesn't mean it's healthy for you if you literally can't stop eating it. Right. You know, it, there's everything's not a one size fits all. And, um, there, and so that that's key here. You know, I don't want to demonize avocado or nuts. Uh, and, and, um, and there, there's a bell curve, a spectrum of how we handle these foods. Right. I mean, I, I know that many of the doctors like Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Barnard, even on the show said, there's not one food that everyone has to eat. <laughs> that's true. That is true. Thank um, you, doc. All right. Well, uh, once again, with ultra processed food, you know, the it's like the brakes are taken off. You know, the fiber has been taken out of the food. So you don't feel as full and you can have much more calories for uh, you can fill your stomach with much more calories of this processed pre pre digested pre processed foods. Um, the, the food will override your own hunger signals such that you, you may feel like craving to eat them, even you've already eaten a meal, but yet you're still eating the, the processed food. Uh, and another thing about when you remove the fiber and you grind down the, the particles, the small particle size, when it gets into your body, it's easily absorbed. And that causes a rush of, of sugar and an insulin spike. Uh, I don't have a slide on this, but when you think about the way that uh, real drugs are made. If you, I mean, the one example is coca leaves uh, that cocaine is derived from that uh, to chew the leaf may give you some amount of cocaine, but uh, it's way slower than actual processed cocaine, which looks like sugar. It looks like a drug, you know, cocaine powder. Uh, and then you have like uh, crack cocaine that's smoked and that gets into your system even faster. And the reason why I'm talking about this is the is how fast something happens. The rush that you get uh, affects how addictive a substance can be. So if you imagine candy, cotton candy, or you know something that is like really highly processed, you get that sugar rush fast. It's more addictive. So what are the examples of addictive foods? Well, this was a self-reported list of. Uh, this is not an extensive list. There, it goes on maybe about a hundred on the list, but I just put the top 20 here, uh, people wrote down what they thought was the most addictive food for them. And they, they scored the points and they put it all together. And lo and behold, things like chocolate ice cream, French fries, pizza, cookies are on the top of the list. And actually nuts made it onto this yeah. list. Top nuts, 20 made it. Yeah. nuts made it. Okay. 
So we're going to get now into the actual definition of food addiction. Uh, and, and so bear with me here because there, there, some of this is kind of a dense, uh, dense, but uh, it's basically three C's. You're addicted based on compulsive use, attempts to cut down in a feeling of loss of control, despite, you know, trying to uh, do otherwise. And that the, the, you know that the, that the use is going to cause problems, health problems, social problems, but you can't stop despite these consequences. So the three C's, you know, cravings, loss of control and consequences, these are closely mirrored to the DSM criteria for substance use disorder. So there is no uh, diagnosis of food addiction right now. Uh, the DSM lags behind uh, because it, it's periodically reviewed and new diagnoses are created. But right now there is no diagnosis of food addiction. But as this, this relates to substance use disorder, so there's cravings, like strong urges to use, uh, tolerance and withdrawal symptoms related to stopping, loss of control, uh, trying to make attempts to quit, uh, you know, affecting your job uh, and having high consequences um, such as, uh, you know, guilt and uh, hiding your use. Um, and so sometimes people feeling so sick because they've eaten so much that failing to meet obligations such as, you know, uh, life's uh, personal obligations for the family or work, um, feeling distressed about it and having emotional problems related to your eating. So those are the three C's. But now what we're going to talk about is if you want to pay attention and you want to stop the video and go back and forth, this is the actual modified Yale food addiction scale. So you can find this, uh, you can Google modified Yale food addiction scale and you'll find it for free on uh, University of Michigan's website. It's called Fast Labs. And uh, so there's a site where you can download the uh, the actual food addiction scale, but I've taken the scale out. Uh, and so we can talk about it right here. So uh, it's three slides with these, uh, I think, 13 questions. And the first slide here is, this is whether you have experienced this monthly. Monthly, I avoided work, school, or social activities because I was afraid I would overeat there. I, my overeating got me in the, in the way of taking care of my family or doing household chores. I was so distracted by eating that I could have been hurt, like I was driving a car and could have got in a wreck. My friends and family were worried about how much I overate. So if he's answered yes to this for at least once a month uh, of this occurrence, that would give you one point on each one of these questions. Okay, next, weekly, weekly. Have you experienced this weekly at least? I ate to the point where I became physically ill. If I had emotional problems, if I hadn't eaten certain foods, then I would eat those foods to make myself feel better. I kept eating in the same way, even though eating caused emotional problems. I had strong urges to eat certain foods that I couldn't think of anything else. So if you've had any of those, uh, at least once a week, you would give yourself a point. And the last slide here on the modified food addiction scale is if you experience this two to three times a week or more. So two to three times a week, I spent a lot of time feeling sluggish and tired from overeating or my behavior caused me a lot of distress. I had significant problems in my life because of eating. Uh, they may have been problems with my daily routine, work, friends, or family, or my health. Or eating the same amount of food did not give me as much enjoyment as it used to. It's a tolerance question. And I tried and failed to cut down or stop eating certain foods. Okay, so you have just listened to the modified uh, Yale Food Addiction Scale. And you can add up each one of those where uh, you were positive and uh, give a point for each one. And the reason why I really wanted to agree, I took the time to go over each question is that by listening to this talk, you may think, oh my gosh, maybe I have a food addiction. Well, it's really about severity because I think many of us experience aspects of food addiction. And it's really, is it a problem with your life? And so if you're having moderate Mild, mild, you can probably deal with it on your own. Uh, moderate, potentially. If you're having severe symptoms, you want to seek help 
you want to you you have to admit that you're dealing with a problem and that food may be having a power over you and that you may become powerless to the chemical dependency that's going on in your brain. Once again, there's a spectrum of severity and these are not mutually exclusive or you know you don't have to have binge eating disorder to be a, have food addiction. Uh, but you could be a passive overeater. I'm a passive overeater. If there's food in front of me, I tend to eat. And uh, sometimes my wife will say, are you really that hungry that you're getting seconds or thirds? Thank goodness I eat a whole food plant-based diet with no oil, salt, oil, or sugar so that I can, I mean, I can eat a lot of food. I can really fill up my stomach. But some people just kind of eat till it's gone. We're trained to clean our plate, so to speak, and, and can stop paying attention to fullness cues. So there's compulsive eating. There's binge order, a uh, binge eating disorder. And then there's binge eating disorder with food addiction. What about the prevalence? If you take people with these different disorders and you give them the modified Yale food addiction scale, you will see that uh, many people will be positive for uh, food addiction. So that when you take normal controls, maybe studies will say from three to 20%. If you take folks who are uh, obese and you give them this scale, you can go from 20 to 50% in some studies. Uh, and along with these other disordered eating, all the way up to binge eating and bulimia nervosa, pretty pretty high rates of food addiction. Okay, so you've heard about the Yale food addiction scale, but let's talk about my story about how the cookie flew into my mouth. Well, there is the story of the three-part brain. And everybody knows that as you know, humans, we have a big cortex, we're rational thinkers, they're rational. Uh, well, the cortex is doing the thinking, but that stuff underneath the cortex, there's the limbic system and the brainstem. The brainstem, some people call the reptilian brain that takes care of our bodily functions. Uh, above that is the limbic system. And that's where all this stuff about the addictive behaviors is really becoming hardwired. The nucleus accumbens, uh, it's the emotion center, desires and urges are there. And so the problem is, is that many times these instinctive behaviors and emotional behaviors play a bigger role in our behaviors than we think, and we give it credit. So emotions are the king and queen. Uh, the rational brain is less powerful. And the analogy is that the rational brain is like the rider a tiny rider sitting on top of an elephant. And that you all know it's true because you know that your emotions sometimes override your normal behaviors, uh, rational behaviors, because you've been in an argument before and you've said some horrible stuff that you wouldn't have said normally uh, in a normal argument, uh, normal rational talking. Um, and you may have been like me where you're almost in like a fugue state or a forgetful state, self-forgetting where the cookie just made it right into your mouth without almost even thinking. Uh, and, and so this is where the emotion brain, emotional brain uh, took precedence and uh, I have to protect myself from myself. Okay. This is the idea of willpower. Willpower as, as, an, as a potential uh, resource that can be drained. Uh, and what we're talking about here is the food temptation spectrum. Let's say you're trying to avoid situations where you have to use your willpower. Well, uh, you have to start to learn that which situations can you be comfortable in and which, which situations do you have to have uh, your defenses up and be planned for. So the home can be hopefully a safe space where you have prepared food, prepared vegan food, whole food, plant-based diet, uh, likely you're going to eat right, you know, but if you have no prepared and food and it's the end of the day, you may be, you know, dialing DoorDash uh, to get, get food because it's not easy. You'll eat sleazy. You know, you're, you're going to, you're, you're going to have a potential temptation there. Oh my God. Did you just make that up? That's fabulous. This is a Dr. Harrington's, uh, you know, saying if you, if it's not easy, you'll eat sleazy. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if you're at a restaurant, oh my gosh, you have to plan. This is a minefield. You have to go, you have to talk to, uh, you know, the chef maybe, or you, you, you know, you really have to prepare 
go early and make sure that you're going to do the right thing or else you're probably going to go off. You're going to be non-compliant. Uh, a party is even worse. You, you know, you have people, lots of unhealthy food around, celebratory mood. What the heck? You only live once. Uh, a family gathering can sometimes be even worse because you're getting judged by other family members and uh, they they feel fine to make comments about the way you eat or tradition. Um, and then if you're in like a an amusement park or a sporting event and they're selling hot dogs and there's nothing to eat, you know, that is just, you know, you're in a food desert. And so th these are these are kind of this food temptation spectrum. OK, here is the idea that along with disordered eating from binge eating disorder versus food addiction versus a normal eater, there 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 can be different treatments. There can be there's different problems and different treatments. So uh, this is described by Dr. Vera Tarman uh, in, in her talk, even with talks with Chef AJ, which I love. And then uh, this comes from Philip Wardell and some of his work. So first you have normal, normal overeating. And what's the problem with that? So well, you can think of the sugar crash. If you're eating a lot of sugar, then you have a crash and from the insulin spike, you feel hungry again and you go through this cycle of always feeling, All right, I gotta have more food. Um, so then there's eating to soothe yourself, eating, eating food to soothe yourself. If you think about um, when we're breastfeeding as a child, that we're naturally, you know, sweet and fatty breast milk is soothing and it's hitting these, you know, opioid re like receptors and soothing us. And so uh, in this, the problem is actually eating to comfort yourself, your trauma that you've experienced in the past. And so with binge eating disorder and bulimia, this, this is where you're eating to soothe yourself. And this is a, a different, the solution is different. Versus food addiction, where you're actually, you have set up a chemical de deficient, uh, a chemical dependency because of the obesogenic environment and the constant stimulation and dopamine uh, rush that you've been getting from these high sugar and fatty meals, uh, causing cravings and loss of control. It's an actual chemical, different problem. So what do you do for, if you're a normal overeater, you have to surround yourself with a whole food plant-based diet, unprocessed foods, have lifestyle changes. Uh, but if you are dealing with a lot of emotional eating, then you need to get coping skills and you need to resolve past trauma, the, uh, get cognitive behavioral therapy and other psychological therapies to help, uh, help this. Uh, without that, you might continue to have these problems and uh, despite efforts to, to try to, to fix it. And for food addiction, for a chemical dependency, if you're on this severe range of these, these questions that we've mentioned, then you may need an actual abstinence program. You may need to go to some place like True North where you're giving your receptors, the chemical receptors in your brain, the dopamine, you're giving them a break. And you're going from down-regulating your dopamine receptors to up-regulating. Your, your, the pathway is starting to, uh, you're, you're getting yourself a way to draw draw new paths in your brain. Uh, you have to admit that there's that food has a control that you are powerless in the setting of these ultra processed foods. It's either self forgetting and uh, cookies flying into your mouth without you know rationally having um, uh, control over it. Twelve step programs. Okay, we're near the end here, and we're going to go over. Uh, some summaries, some summaries of what uh, what we've talked about here today, and some ways to help control uh, addictive behaviors. So once again, first, if if you're high on that uh, Yale food addiction scale, then you have to realize that that you're becoming tolerant to the high high exposure to the fat and sugar in your brain, and it's a dopamine thing, and it has it has a hold on you. And you're having to eat more and more and more, and you need to break the cycle. So first, you have to have insight that this is controlling you, and you have to get, you have to um, realize that, and give yourself over to a treatment program. Uh, absent, you can't be abstinent from food. You can't be abstinent from food. So you have to eat food. And so the, what you do is you have to eat whole, unprocessed food, and you have to give yourself a break from those high stimulating. Uh, dopamine rushes. And that is going to take a while, two weeks, three weeks. 
you're going to get the most benefit in that that first short term part, but there is going to be some suffering initially. But uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel because just like your body adapts to downreg dop downregulate dopamine, you can upregulate those dopamine receptors as well. I don't recommend if you have true food addiction. I don't recommend fasting uh, as such as intermittent fasting or, uh, you know, no eating till a certain time during the day. And the reason is, is because you're already prone to binge behavior. You want to, uh, you want to set up pre-planned meals where you're, you're feeding yourself nutritious food uh, uh, on, on a regular schedule um, just to avoid a binge, uh, avoid making it harder for yourself. There, you will find there's various triggers and cues. And so you have to pay attention to this. You have to realize that if you go to certain restaurants or if you are around certain people, or if you if caffeine is something that stimulates you to go off path and be non-compliant, you have to you have to acknowledge that that these there is uh, co co sort of co-dependent substances where uh, this is where people smoke and drink at the same time. So you, you have to be careful with other substances. Uh, with support, support is crucial. Support is critical, and this means with your family. If you have people that eat around you in a non-compliant way that uh, triggers you, you have to acknowledge that and you have to figure out ways where you talk with them about it and help them to help, help you. You have to label saboteurs. If people are uh, picking at you and trying to say they're eating in a way, you have to confront them directly and you have to you know, tell them it hurts your feelings, tell them that you're a food addict if you have to, and tell them that you need their help. And, 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 if, and if you're not helping them, you have to kind of avoid that person. With addiction, with any kind of addictive behavior, it takes practice. Quitting takes practice such that, you know, you've heard of people smoking and having a high recidivism. Well, when you're having, when you're trying to get off ultra processed foods, there can be a lot of recidivism. There can be nonlinear improvement. Uh, but if you fall off the bandwagon, just get right back on that next bandwagon coming along. I, one of my patients that says that, and uh, uh, I, uh, I love that saying. Have other healthy behaviors. See if you can kickstart your brains, your endorphins, and the positive things in your brain with healthy behaviors like exercise, being outdoors. Make sure you're allowing your brain to heal and make the upregulating changes that it needs to by getting good sleep at night. Once again, if you're really severely addicted, you need to get a, a team approach, uh, getting a support group, whether it's like a, a support Facebook group, but then actually having potentially in-person visits like group therapy or a 12-step program, especially if you have a spiritual, um, if you want a face-based approach, you can go a 12-step program. Have a coach or an, a therapist, especially if you have emotional aspects to your addiction. And have a doctor on your side as well, because you may have actually developed medical problems related to uh, weight or overeating. Okay, so that's my talk about a food addiction. Ultra processed foods are addictive. Eat a whole food plant-based diet and get the help you need. I'm Dr. Harrington. I accept Aetna Cigna TRICARE Medicare. Uh, I'm in 23 states right now where I can be your doctor. And I would love to see you. I'm also in Pine Isles Park in Florida. That's near St. Petersburg. And thank you so much for your attention. And I'm ready to answer your questions. Well, thank you. And I'm sure there's going to be some in the chat. The ones that were sent in, I'm not so sure they're on this topic, but I'm going to ask you, I don't know if you read my book, but I have a food addiction quiz on page. Oh, at the beginning, you want to hear my food addiction quiz? It's not as famous yeah. as Yale's, but mine is, do you, number one, it's 10 questions. And I say, so how do you know if you have a problem with a particular type of food or drink? Please ask yourself these 10 questions and answer as honestly as possible. Number one, do you absolutely have to consume it daily or perhaps several times a day? Number two, do you feel bad if you're unable to get your fix? Number three, do you think about it often and can't wait until you're able to consume it again, even if you just had it? Number four, is it difficult for you to moderate your use of it? Number five, do you often consume more of it than you intended to? 
Number six, do you often feel shame or regret after consuming it? Number seven, do you have physical or emotional withdrawal symptoms when you try to abstain from it? Number eight, is it difficult for you to get through even a single day without consuming this substance? Number nine, does abstaining from it result in any physical or emotional discomfort? Number 10, does the mere thought of abstaining from it bring on strong emotions such as anxiety, sadness, anger, or grief? If you answer yes to any of these questions, you may be suffering from an addiction. So I love it. That's my yeah. little test. Hey, you mentioned passive overconsumption, and I hear that a lot from Dr. Olvier and Dr. Goldhammer, especially how salt contributes to passive overconsumption. Maybe, maybe unwind that a little bit. I don't know if everybody understands what that means. Well, your body should have normal fullness cues, and you. Uh, but when you're eating ultra processed foods, that it will, you might it might cue you to eat food at a very rapid pace, such that you overeat before you uh, can. Your body can sense that it's full. Um, I I uh, once again I use the 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 saying stop, drop, and roll. You're on fire. Uh, so the salt uh, is a food uh, flavor enhancer, and you're having super normal, super normal stimuli. So it's causing you almost to mindlessly and uh, you know passively overeat. You're not even you're not even paying attention. You're in a mindless scenario, and you're just. Um, some people, uh, you know, the concept is there could be a chemical dependency from the sugar and the fat creating a dopamine. Um, but there's other hormones at play, uh, you know, insulin and, and um, leptin. There's other hormones at play where people have almost like a fullness addiction where they have to just feel so full, so full that they're, because they're deriving sort of the pleasure from uh, those other hormones. And, and so that, that, that's at play too, where the stronger, the stronger one is how sweet and salty and fatty something is. But once again, there's some people have to get so used to feeling not feeling satisfied and until they're till they've gorged themselves. And don't they become dopamine insensitive after that and where they need more to feel less? Yes. And it, it's it's really sad because it kind of relates to other things in their life, too. Uh, and there can be some cross. Um, so you imagine that someone who has um, you know, cocaine addiction they may not get the same amount of pleasure from just eating normally or from, you know, sex or something like that. They may, they literally may not have as much enjoyment uh, of, of these things as well. So um, it's sad. You have to, you have to make yourself sensitive to these things again by through abstinence. Yeah. I love that. Not everybody's able to do abstinence. What do you think about harm reduction? That's the thing is if, if, if Dr. Goldhammer always says, if you could have controlled it, you would have controlled it. And so this idea of cutting down on an addictive substance, I think is, is torture. Yeah. That, that, that's, you know, the moderation, you know, how, how moderate do you want your diabetes? It, it, it's uh, that's what Dr. Greger says. And uh, I, I, you really, what, the problem is, is, is the insight. The problem is the insight and the acceptance. That's why kind of in these 12 step programs, you have to say I'm powerless. I'm powerless over the substance because uh, if, if you eat, you know, eat, remember the, the, the guy who did spud fit, spud fit, uh, yeah, where Andrew spud fit Taylor. Sure. Yeah. He, 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 he's a good example where he said that he would just, he couldn't just have a piece of cake. He ate the whole cake. And um, so you, you have to recognize and you, you have to realize uh, and I think you've said it many times, Chef AJ, uh, that people say that it's much more painful to try to moderate. You're always on edge. You're always trying to uh, to avert the binge, the binge instead of just avoiding it altogether. It's just it's an easier way to go. I know that's what Dr. Furman also says. He's going to come on the day before Halloween, which is a deadly holiday for food. Addicts. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's deadly. Richard wants to know if you'll possibly be renewing your a uh, license in Connecticut. And Debbie says, will you ever get one in Maine? I am not currently uh, getting one in Connecticut or Maine at this time. Uh, we, we've had uh, such, I, 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 I have to have enough patients that will 
at least pay for the license uh, in these these states. And I'm actually kind of paring down on some of the states. It's it's sad or whatever, but uh, I have to um, in the states that I have more patients, I will continue to keep up. Uh, and, and so it, it, I know it's a chicken or the egg type thing, but uh, you know there has been sort of a steady decline in some of the states that I have have just a few patients. I'm, I'm so sorry about that. Okie doke. And here is, hey, if they'll, what if they pay for your license? Then, <laughs> <laughs> or, well, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. or maybe they could travel to a nearby state. I mean, some states are close to other states and you could just kind of like drive over the border and just. Yeah, so them. Massachusetts, I am licensed in Massachusetts. I had a bunch of patients in Massachusetts, so I kept, kept that license. That's fantastic. Anne says, how do I get past the initial stage so that I can become abstinent of processed food? I feel powerless with the craving and cannot afford to go to a fat camp type place. I would say then make your home a fat camp type place and don't have any junk food in the house. As Dr. Lyle says, we must work harder on our environment than we do ourselves. Wow. Great answer. Uh, of course. Sorry uh, about that, that I answered it. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. I mean, you are an expert on this, Chef AJ. I mean, you've been talking about this concept. You've had specialists, experts in this, con you know, world experts in this concept on. And so um, I feel very humbled to, uh, you know, to be talking about this, this topic, but um, yeah, you know, not, er not everyone can afford to go to spend a lot of money to go to one of these places. So uh, you can work with some, you know, just like in with other things, there's something called uh, intensive outpatient therapy, where it, it related to other mental health disorders, so to speak where people will go almost every day or they will meet up every day, maybe on through a Zoom uh, just to check in. And, uh, and we have this kind of process where it's intensive at first and you, you need a lot of help at first uh, to because you, you will experience the cravings and this kind of thing at first. So, yep, in, in like an intensive outpatient type of therapy. Now, if you can't go to like True North, then I would encourage you to look locally to see if there is a, a plant-based dietitian that, that might help or, you know, locally in your area that might have a, a program like this. Yep, absolutely. There is support and it doesn't always have to be expensive. So Rich is saying you can hide food addiction more easily than say drug or alcohol addiction. And, you know, Dr. Frank Sabatino often says that food is the only addiction that's like, you can do it in public. It's socially acceptable. It's easily affordable. You know, it's <laughs> readily available, you know. It's easy. It's legal. It's acceptable. And so, yeah, with the obesogenic environment where it's, it's all around us. And so it's, it, I think we have to take a moment now to talk about um, the normalization theory of the, you know, I heard, I heard someone talking about this on the Rich Roll podcast, which was uh, a, an alcohol specialist. And they were talking about how there is this um, myth, myth of the normalization. The, the sort of the discussion was that alcohol in Europe where the difference between US and, and, and Europe might be that in, in Europe, they expose kids to alcohol a little earlier at the dinner table and that somehow they normalize this behavior such that they don't go crazy with excitement about alcohol when they go to college and, and, and that this was somehow to be a healthier behavior, a healthier relationship with alcohol. However, turns out that in Europe, they have higher rates of alcoholism and you know, not, not in every county or, or, or so to speak, but that they have potentially more problems with alcohol. And so this is goes to a concept of exposure to the chemical is, is one of those factors that causes the pathways in the brain. So it, it's simply like we live in an obesogenic environment. We're exposed to these things all the time. The more we're exposed is the more likely that we're going to become addicted. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And Annette says, would you recommend wearing a CGM to see what food does to your blood sugar? I, I don't get this because food always raises your blood sugar. That's what food is supposed to do, right? Right, 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 right. Yeah, okay. I actually think that uh, CGMs are cool. I, really? I, I think they're pretty cool. And um, I, rec I give them to my patients. You know, I can help my patients get prescribed CGMs and... This is because it's a pain to self-monitor. It's a pain, you know, if you're doing a food log that, um, but if you're actually wearing a glucometer and you can see it going all the time, you can see what you, what you see is that 
our goal is to try to uh, avoid area under the curve. If you imagine a, a spike of blood sugar, then it comes back down to your baseline and then a spike for lunch and then a spike for dinner. If you take each one of those spikes and you, you cut off the baseline, uh, this area under the curve or the exposure to the high sugar is what is causing damage to your vessels and uh, the elevated hemoglobin A1C, the, the, the you know, almost like rusting of the cells in a way. So this area under the curve, what you'll see is if you wear one of those glucometers, every time you do a snack and you're at your baseline again, oh my God, it goes right back up again and comes back down. It takes about an hour uh, at least, even if you eat a non-fatty substance to, to get back down to baseline. But if you have a, a, a large meal or meal with fat, significant fat in it, it will last much longer. So I really like CGMs because they give people immediate feedback and it's visual. Uh, and so they're monitoring. And the biggest thing that you learn uh, with the CGMs is the chronobiology, is the way the circadian rhythms affect the blood sugar. And so the same meal that you eat after dark will cause the blood sugar spike to last way longer. And, and so the goal is to try to use that uh, to actually change your behavior. If, if you're gonna wear it and not change your behavior, I don't recommend spending the money on it. If you're not gonna look at the, the way the spikes are changing, then, then don't, don't do it. I mean, the meter itself is not what causes you to be healthy. It's, it's if you're gonna moderate your behavior. That's very interesting that the same meal eating at a different time has a different effect. Absolutely. I did not know. Okay, this is I'm not this question from Anne. If you only crave very specific things and no other sugar will do, does it indicate a mental health issue? Well, there, there could be there could be other associations related to that food that has have been baked in to your, to your behavior, the uh, firing and wiring together analogy, so, such that um, maybe when you were younger, your mom would give you cookies when you did something right or every night and, you know, as a soothing thing that you might be getting additional, um, uh, you, you might, might be seeking it out for emotional reasons as opposed to um, chemical dependency reasons. If you're not having problems or overeating all the time, that, that kind of thing. Yep. Well, you know, I always found that um, it, 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 true hunger can be alleviated by eating any food, but if you have to have a particular food, that's food addiction. It's crave, you know, cravings that are food addiction, you know? Yeah. And cravings are powerful. You know, some people dismiss cravings, but uh, with, with dopamine and uh, the urge, I, I like, I liken it to the idea of someone who has skin that is itchy, you know, and that, you know, it's the scratch and itch. I mean, that can be how strong the, the craving can be. Uh, and, and so, yeah, you, you want to, you want to try to have alternate foods that are, that are healthy and safe and, uh, to help decrease the help to make the craving less strong. Yeah. Good idea. Okay. Here's a question from empower your life. Someone close to me has an addiction that is affecting my life. This person has a friend who will not help them avoid their addiction where they enable them. Should I have a talk with the friend? Well, absolutely. I mean, if, if, if you feel uh, confident and, 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 and strong and, and you feel like that that's going to help definitely help, help, help out and, and talk to them directly and, and let them know that uh, about the food addiction and that they're enabling this person. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's hopefully a positive. It, it, I feel like it's worth it. It's worth putting yourself out there and worth alienating somebody to, 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 because if they truly care about uh, that person's uh, welfare, then they'll, they'll stop. Yeah, it's hard, even with an intervention. So yeah. here's a question from Mark. Can even whole food plant compliant sauces and dressing cause overeating a different level of the pleasure trap? If they have salt and fat, I mean, even healthy things like, you know, coconut aminos, mis I mean, if people are sensitive, you know, anytime you have sugar, fat and salt, even like a date nut dessert for some people, that's a pleasure trap. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's a sad truth. 
it's the sad truth, you know, and we're all, we're all looking for the things on the fringe that, that, uh, that might be, that might be okay, or might be um, a free game or uh, neutral territory. Uh, you know, we're all, we're all trying to so, say, well, how, you know, it is hard to label foods as good or bad. And that's it, because, you know, it, 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 it does, um, there, you worried about sort of disorders about that. However, um, it's, you have to have personal insight. Is this food triggering to you? Do I overeat it? And if it's really salty or if it, if it's really fatty, you're probably going to, it's probably going to trigger you to overeat. Yeah. Instead of good or bad, I like to think compliant or non-compliant or health promoting or health compromising, you know, that kind of thing. Cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I want to talk a second about the idea of abstinence causing people to binge. And it is, it, I mean, because we have to kind of talk about this directly because some people would suggest that by discussing this in abstinence, that people with disordered eating would, um, that it, it could be sort of triggering for them, uh, the idea of abstinence. Uh, and, but there have been studies that show that abstinence from the ultra processed food uh, helps to, uh, you know, decrease the receptor uh, and upregulate your normal be he be healthy dopamine response. Um, and that, uh, so you got to give yourself time off of the ultra processed foods. I'm not saying people fast or avoid food. I'm saying you have to eat the healthy unprocessed food. Yeah, thank you. I agree. Uh, Richard says, just out of curiosity, are there drugs that help with food addiction and do antidepressants work? Well, this, I mean, this, there, you know, I, I don't like to basically think of drugs as the way out. Uh, and, and so just taking that as baseline, uh, I, I don't want to like put an endorsement out there, you know, for any specific drug, but uh, there are things that have been studied like naloxone, which is used for, uh, for addictive rever you know, reversal of, of opioids, uh, that people do eat differently under naloxone, but that hasn't really made its way into, um, into, uh, food addiction, you know, uh, cause it just doesn't, doesn't really work that way. Um, but there are the new medicines, the GLP-1 agonists that seem to affect people's uh, addictive behaviors. It's been studied in alcohol even. Um, but hasn't had like an FDA approval where people are taking these diabetes drugs, GLP-1, which works on weight loss, makes people feel full and makes people not crave as much, um, that these are sort of starting to, in the future, they may make their way into, uh, as a part of a treatment. However, uh, once again, I don't want to, you know, ideally you would work with the abstinence and you'd be treating the actual chemical problem in the brain, uh, uh with the healthy behaviors as opposed to sort of the way out with the, the medication. Thank you. Here's one. Denise says, I'm not addicted to any one food item. I just have a problem with overeating. I eat mostly until I'm stuffed. How do you get that under control? Well, you can sort of take the judo approach, the judo approach where, you know, you use your opponent's weight against them. Whereas, you know, if you have this behavior of liking to overeat or feel, feel that fullness, uh, the, uh, if you're eating food in a whole food plant-based diet, you know, chef AJ is all about this eating uh, under the red line, the 600 calories per pound or less, you can eat to you know, feel stuffed and satisfied, uh, if you're eating a low calorie density food. And so that's, you may find that unless you're eating this way, you're going to continue to gain weight because you'll, uh, eat you'll eat to satiety, but if you're adding foods above the red line, above 600 calories per pound, then you're going to start to gain weight. And so um, I don't think you'll ever necessarily be able to get that out of your system. Um, eat, you know, it's hard to train yourself to eat less, honestly. It's very hard. Well, you know, also this idea that Dr. Goldhammer talks about like sequencing your meals, you know, starting with the less calorically dense, high nutrient foods first having, you know, they, they teach at True North, the buffet is set up where you eat like a pound of raw salad, a pound of steamed greens, and then you still get the satiating starches, but you can't eat quite as much and still you're, eat, you're so full because you're eating so many pounds of food, you know? I love this. I love this. I've heard you talk about sequencing and I've started to tell my patients about it as a, as a way to, um, uh, as a great sort of method, uh, a way of eating, 
uh, and um, I didn't know that uh, Dr. Goldhammer came up with it, but that is. Uh, oh, I don't know if he came up with yeah. it. It's just his buffet is designed that way. And my husband yeah. exactly, that and he's super skinny because you have maximum enjoyment of the food because the more calorically concentrated the calories, the more dopamine is released. And so if you eat, if you start with dessert, which is what I used to do when I was 60 pounds heavier, or if you eat your delicious, you know, air fries and, and you know, it's hard to go back to the salad and the steamed vegetables. So we've just always we just eat that way every meal because we get maximum enjoyment because hunger is the best sauce and you don't really enjoy, you know, the lower calorically dense foods after you've eaten something of a higher caloric density. So we just naturally eat this way and it's healthy and, you know, we I, eat in our weight. I love that. What, one of the things that I would end up telling my patients is the idea of, I, I don't know if you've ever been to a wine tasting, you know, I haven't been to one of these in years and years, but uh, you know, if you, if you eat the food or if you drink the wine, that is, um, uh, sweet first, then the wine that is uh, more dry or has a vinegary taste tastes like vinegar. So you have to start with the like least tasty food, least tasty wine in this case. Uh, and you have to work your way up to the more sweeter, uh, and, uh, more flavorful, I guess, wines. So if you treat your food this way, that if you eat, yeah, like the saucy or the, you know, fried or dried food, food first, it's going to make the other food relatively taste, taste worse. So you have to start with the food that has the lowest calorie density and the, and the most subtle flavor and, and, and kind of go for, you know, denser and denser. But I like, I like the sequencing plan that just spells it out quickly. Yeah. I, you know, I've never been to a wine tasting cause I never drank wine. Cause I, never, <laughs> I always thought alcohol was stupid and I yeah. never, luckily never liked the taste of it. So, okay. Here from Lissa saying, I'm looking forward to tackling my issues. One of my goals is to get off insulin and any and all meds. Has Dr. Harrington found the process challenging to reduce or remove insulin? Yes and no. Yes and no. So if you have burned out your pancreas and you require insulin, uh, there's no way to get that back if, if the pancreas is actually not producing enough insulin anymore. And this is what's known as type 1 diabetes and, and, and you require it. But um, there is a type two diabetes, an insulin resistance, where you can, uh, as you know, you lose weight, uh, as exercise, as you improve your insulin sensitivity, that your your pancreas will produce enough insulin to um, to get the job done and and make you not be diabetic. Uh, however, like when when you're if you've been type two for a long time and you've been on insulin for a long time there might be some burnout of the, of the pancreas as well. So we try, uh, but sometimes, sometimes insulin is required. Uh, and, and so I can't give you the blanket statement, but yes, I've had many patients that have been able to come off insulin uh, if their pancreas is producing insulin and they lose weight and they're on a, a whole food plant-based diet that's low fat, uh, it's totally doable. Thanks. Uh, Randy says, are you still licensed in Ohio? Yes, absolutely. Ohio is still, still going strong. Great. And um, Sharon says, I agree about wearing a continuous glucose monitor. I've lost another 60 pounds, 16 pounds. It hold, holds me accountable for what I put in my mouth. I love the benefits of this device. And oh, thank you. Uh, Denise says, what do you think about the Lumen to track your metabolism? I've never heard of that. I'm not tracking the lumen. I'm going to do a quick, uh, a quick Google search. Uh, and I, I, I'll probably recognize it once we, um, okay. Lumen, lumen monitor. I'm going to type that in. All right. While you're looking it up, I'll read a question from Marley. I love that name by the way, but is a craving for a very small amount and no overindulging still an addiction, like a little piece of dark chocolate. I think it depends who you ask. Okay. So it looks like lumen is some sort of, uh, you're, you're like breathing into it, hacking your metabolism. I don't know much about that. So I guess I can't talk about it right now. So, um, this, 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 uh, next question was about is a little bit okay every now and then. Yeah. Or is it a, a craving if you're, if it's a small amount? Well, um, once again, there, there's, there is a spectrum of disordered eating and food addiction, and you might be able to sort of scratch that itch with a small amount of chocolate, and this may not make you go over the edge and binge, 
And so we all have to have this self-awareness and insight uh, about this kind of thing. I will say that a lot of times we end up setting up rituals. We set up rituals that can start to be destructive over time where, uh, where people will uh, say like, I've done my work for the day. There's this one person, one of my patients had this ritual where um, they, they've done their work for the day uh, and they had these, uh, these cookies and they would cut up these little frozen cookies and they would put one or two cookies in the oven and they would smell the, and it was like their reward for the end of the day. And they really enjoyed this. And one, one cookie was not that much, but that over time she started to gain weight because she, she was using this as a reward. Um, and, and so if that one little piece of chocolate is, is every day, then it's calories that you're in, calories in every day, eventually it's going to cause problems. Thanks. I, real quick, I, I have to, I want to, I want to talk about this too, is the sure. idea of dessert at every meal. Dessert at every meal. There's this sort of thing, like, I don't remember growing up where dessert at every meal was a thing, but uh, it's- Or even seems, every day, even every right. day. Yeah. I mean, we have to treat our, uh, we have to remember that we're, we're uh, managing our dopamine resistance. We're managing our dopamine resistance. The more you expose yourself to these uh, strong stimuli, the more resistance to dopamine you get. So you have to really space these things out uh, as best you can. Uh, so no need to have dessert at every meal. Uh, fruit is, is, is generally safe. Fruit is generally safe. Uh, and fruit is very rewarding, uh, especially when you're, you're used to old, unprocessed meals. Fruit is very uh, rewarding. And so fruit is what's for dessert. I know that Dr. Furman says that all the time. Absolutely. Uh, and if people don't enjoy the whole natural food, it's time to get to True North and do a water fast because <laughs> believe me, you will love everything afterwards without sugar, oil, salt, and extra unnecessary fat. So a lot of questions on gum there. I'll read both of them. Uh, Eileen says, do you think sugar-free gum like Trident can help a crutch? I feel like it does, especially at night. And then Sheila says, can sugar-free gum like Trident help with food addictions at night? I, the experts I've interviewed said absolutely not. And it's not good for you for a lot of other reasons, but I'll let you say your opinion. Well, uh, some of these things have fake sugars in them. Uh, I, I, I kind of like the idea of, you know, you're triggering your end of eating time, end of the day eating time with like brushing your teeth. And if I guess if chewing gum is kind of that trigger for you to sort of stop eating, um, that, that's one thing, you know, chewing it, it induces saliva and it's, it's a, a masticating mechanism, you know, so uh, chewing may kind of prime you for wanting to eat potentially. Uh, so that's a, a potential problem. But the other thing is this, this fake sugar. Some of the fake sugars are actually sort of stronger, have sent a stronger signal to the, uh, to the brain that uh, they're more potent. It's kind of like the idea of um, heroin is strong, but fentanyl is stronger. It's like more synthetic and, 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 and uh, it's like 10 times the strength or, or something like this. And so um, even though maybe these aren't calorie producing sugars, they are still acting on the brain, and uh, and so I, I I would I would put them in the problematic category, uh, you know, even, even though it's non-caloric and that that kind of thing. So maybe do some other things like brush your teeth, uh, and you know, step away, get away from the kitchen uh, to, to have other signals. There's the idea of maybe herbal tea, so that you have that oral fixation where you're actually using the mouth, but it's non-caloric, that kind of thing. Perfect. Thank you. And, da, da, da. Oh, you know what, if you don't mind, just because they did take the time to write in, can I read you please a question not on this topic from Miko, and she wants to know if a tinge test on skin for iodine is reliable to see if someone has enough or lacks iodine in their body. I'm not familiar with the tinge test. Uh, I'm looking that up. Um... I'm looking that up. I know that one way to do this is a urinary, uh, random urinary iodine. Another test is a 24 hour urine iodine collection. However, that's kind of more of a pain. So uh, if people have uh, thyroid problems and they haven't started thyroid medicine yet, and they want to see if they can um, optimize their iron, I'm sorry, iodine intake, because iodine is an element in the middle of a, th a thyroid hormone molecule. 
Um, so we would do a random, just so you just pee in a cup and that's it, to, uh, to add it to the normal labs to see if you have iodine deficiency. And uh, so, yeah, iodine is in Morton salt, the old, you know, the lady with the umbrella, the Morton salt, but you get a lot of actual salt from the two pinches of, of, of sodium that uh, you get. So you try to get sea vegetables. There are Kelp is too high in, in iodine, so you can't really eat kelp, but you can have a kelp shaker that is almost like a, a salt shaker where you can get uh, iodine that way or through uh, supplemental form. But uh, yeah, so I, ideally you're getting it from a whole food through uh, sea vegetables. Nice. Great. I agree with you about the fake and zero calorie sugars. I don't know anyone that thinks they're a good idea for weight loss or food addiction because you don't get the calorie rewards. So you just don't, you just keep eating. Yeah, totally reasonable. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, great. Well, this is a fun topic. I'm always up for talking about it with you. So let's see. Awesome. Awesome. That's all the questions. So that's, oh, well, speaking of, you know, this, you, you have children. And so what do you guys do for Halloween and trick or treating and, and, and what do you give out or do you just turn the lights off? Uh, yeah, I mean, we we're giving out candy, uh, you know, usually kind of like hard candy type of stuff. Uh, and, um, you know, it's not, it's not totally, um, uh, you know, we, we, we participate a little bit. We love Halloween. I love Halloween. I mean, we made making the costumes and all this stuff. You know, one year we were big hero six where I, I like the theme where we have everyone in the family gets on the same, same theme and then we walk around. And so people say, Oh my gosh, it's big hero six. Um, and this year we're doing Barbie, of course. So I'm going to be, you know, and I was saying, I, I feel the best Halloween costume for you would be to get one of those like air force type jackets and just go to Tom Cruise and just uh, go to Tom Cruise <laughs> yeah, and, um, and, you know, Top Gun. So, cause you don't look like him. So, you know, there anyway. we go. Just got to get those aviator glasses and, exactly. you know, and just a big smile. Arr, yeah. Why not? I think you'd win the contest. Scott or Carrington, you're just so much fun to talk to. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks for having me on Chef AJ. I'm really humbled to be here. Always. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. I do hope you'll come back tomorrow. The show's a little bit later at 3 p.m. Pacific time because this particular doctor has to work and he's done with the clinic at three. You've asked for a plant-based nephrologist to come on. When we had Jen Moore, a wonderful plant-based a dietitian specializing in kidney function. You said, well, let's get a nephrologist. We've got one. His name is Shivam Joshi, Joshi, and he'll be here tomorrow talking about your kidneys and plant-based diets at three o'clock. Take care, Dr. Harrington. I'd love to see you photos of you guys all dressed up like Barbie. All right. All right. Take care, Chef AJ. Uh -huh.